2 Peter chapter number 2. We'll read one verse this morning, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse number 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Let's pray. Father, thank you for an opportunity to stand up here and, uh, and uh, preach, teach your word. Lord, get me out of the way, Lord, that I would not hinder the message that you have uh, this morning for us. And Lord, help me uh, to deliver your message and your word faithfully. Thank you for everyone that came, made the effort to come here uh, through the snow, Lord. Please bless them. Give them a blessing for being here and encourage their hearts and help them, Lord, when they need help. And Lord, may uh, everything that's said and done uh, for the remaining hour here this morning would be honoring, glorifying to Jesus Christ. And we, may we do, as the song says, give you all the glory and let our heart uh, give you the glory, not just our uh, outward motions and uh, bodies, but our heart. Lord, in our heart, we want to give glory to you. And um, thank you for loving us. Thank you for going to that cross. Help us, Lord, as we open up your precious and holy and perfect word this morning. Pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've been going through Second uh, Peter. And Second uh, Peter, like I said uh, many times, is a book about Christian growth. Uh, chapter 1 is about adding to your faith. Uh, growing, in the, uh, growing in the Lord, taking new ground for the Lord. And chapter 2 is about what's going to hinder that growth. And uh, chapter 2, you're, worried about, you're warned about false teachers. And uh, everything's not good, everything's not positive, everything's not, you know, hunky-dory and great and everything. Uh, the Lord, te- Lord says, you watch out, you watch out, because there's going to be some false teachers uh, that come along your, that's going to come along your path and try to mess you up. Um, it, it, if... The, the, the crowd that says don't believe the Bible and, and, and God didn't write the Bible and uh, men just wrote the Bible and, that, and all that, um, you, not, you ought not to pay attention to them, <clears throat> but they're pretty obvious to spot, to spot that they're not from the Lord. They're pretty obvious to, uh, to recognize that, you know, God didn't send them. But someone who, believes the, uh, someone who claims to believe the Bible and holds the Bible and teaches the Bible, but they do it incorrectly, that's the one that the Lord says you need to watch out for because you go, because you, we're here, we're all here because uh, to one extent or another, we want to learn the Bible, right? That's why we're here. And so the Lord says you need to watch out for someone who will take the Bible, but will use it to lead you astray in the wrong way. And the Bible says in chapter two, verse one, but there were false prophets also among the people. Go back to chapter 1, verse 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Chapter 2, verse 1, but. But there were false prophets also. It wasn't just the holy men moved by the Holy Ghost. The Bible says there were false prophets also. Even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them. You can go so far, you can go so far as a, even as a saved person that you can deny, not the Lord, you can deny the Lord that bought you. And the Bible says, let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. Uh, lest you think, well, I may do a lot of things, but I would never go this far. The Bible says, watch out because you don't know what you do when under pressure. You don't know what you do when, it was, uh, when it, was a, it was a matter of life or death or loss of job or loss of income. You don't know how far you would go. And the Bible says, even as there shall be, not might be, not a possibility, there shall, you believe the Bible, you believe the Bible, every word of God is poor, every word of God is pure. The Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You you know what that means? That means 100% of the time, if you call upon the Lord, the Bible says you shall be saved. Praise the Lord. Well, just as sure as you are in that, the Bible says there shall be 
there shall be false teachers among you. So don't be surprised. Don't be taken aback. Don't be taken, uh, 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 taken aback by the fact that there would be a false teacher trying to influence you for the wrong when the Lord told you that's exactly what would happen. Now, a heresy is not, just, is not simply a false doctrine. A heresy is something that harms and influences more than just the person that holds to the heresy. A heresy is something that's brought in, that's brought in to the assembly. It's introduced like leaven into meal. The Bible says, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies. It's something that's brought in from the outside or risen up from among you, but it, it's something that corrupts. It, it's like leaven. Uh, go, go with me to Galatians chapter 5. I want, to talk, I want to preach this morning about damnable damnable heresies. If you're lost, these kind of teachings, we touched on it in Sunday school. If you're lost, these kind of teachings will lead you straight into hell. And the Bible says, and if you're saved, it'll make, it'll, it'll make a shipwreck of your Christian life. You know, the, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 11 not to come together unto condemnation. And the context is saved people. So you can't be condemned as far as your soul, but pretty much everything else can, can get wrecked. Uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse number 16. The Bible says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. That's what the Bible says. So you're not too spiritual to be above this struggle. You're not too right or too righteous to be above fighting this battle. The Bible says the flesh, not bad flesh, not carnal flesh, the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that you would. You will, you will never get to the point of your Christian life where you no longer have to fight this battle. You will never get to the, to the point in your, in your life when you don't have to struggle with this contrary battle within you until the day you go home to be with the Lord. And the Bible says in Galatians 6, he says, don't be weary in well-doing. Don't be weary. Don't be weary with the good fight. Keep, keep fighting. Verse number 18 but if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. Heresies, that's interesting envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So the Bible says that heresy is a work of the flesh. It is something that the flesh desires. And the first time I, I was really getting into my Bible and, and trying to read it and understand it, uh, that took me by surprise, uh, because I always thought of a heresy as more of a you know, a, a head issue, a, a doctrinal uh, issue, but not something that really has anything to do with the flesh. But the Bible says heresy is a work of the flesh. You know what that means? That means it's not just simply a misunderstanding. It's not just that you didn't know. The Bible says it is a work of the flesh. It's what the flesh desires. A heretic is not a heretic because he's wrong. A heretic is, is who he is and what he is but because he desires uh, the attention, the glory that rightfully belongs to the Lord. He, it's not about getting the right. It's not getting things right for the heretic. It's not about getting the truth of the matter. It's about him being right. It's about gaining a following to himself, as we'll see. But look at the look at these look at these works of the flesh here. They're kind of they're kind of grouped together. I don't know if you noticed that. Look at the first four: adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. That's that's all kind of that's all uh, revolves around the sexual sins, I, idolatry and witchcraft. That's that of course goes together. Hatred and variance, emulations, wrath, you see that they're, they're kind of how they're kind of grouped together in similar, similar things. And then what's the next? Well, look at verse 21. Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, that, that all goes together. 
look at the, the last three words of verse 20. Strife, seditions, heresies. Uh, heresy is not about a sincere seeker of the truth trying to help his brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, heresy is related to strife and seditions. It's someone who's not content to be under the God-ordained order that the Lord placed in the church. Uh, it's someone who's not content until they're, and unless they're causing upheaval in a church. And I'm, I know I'm talking a lot, but we'll, we'll, uh, we'll see what the Bible backs up when I'm saying. Uh, a heretic is uh, it's a group within a group. It's like a cancer in a body that eats away. Uh, at, at, at the own at its own uh, body. Um, <clears throat> look at uh, look at chapter uh, look at same chapter. Look at verse uh, twenty four. And they that have crucif uh, they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory. That's where it comes in right there desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, if any man glory, let him glory in the Lord. Uh, you're not supposed to glory in your might and your wisdom and your knowledge and your abilities. You're supposed to glory in the Lord. And once you go from giving all the glory to the Lord and trying to take some of that glory for yourself, then you're setting yourself up for these works of the flesh. In particular, uh, heresies is what we're going to talk about today. Now, a heresy, again, I know I'm talking a lot in the beginning, but we'll, we'll read the verses that back up what I'm saying. A heresy is not simply a false doctrine. It, it, someone is going to take a false doctrine and come into a church and try to pervert that church and turn that church away from the truth or that assembly. Uh, I use the example as the modern version. Uh, we believe that the King James Bible, the authorized version, uh, is the absolute, inerrant, infallible Word of God. And everything else are satanic perversions. We believe that 100%. Uh, it, there's no question about it for any sincere student of the Bible. But if you want to come here and, uh, and bring your NIV and sit in church, I mean this with all my heart, you are absolutely welcome to do that. If you want to come to this church and, and sit there with an ESV and follow along while we preach the Bible, you're welcome to do that. What you're not welcome to do is to try to convince anybody else here of your wrong doctrine. You're not welcome to try to take your false belief and, and in, infect the rest of the body here. Because now you've crossed the line from being wrong to being heretical. Now, every one, now, that's an obvious example, but every one of us, come on, every one of us, none of us can say we've got this whole Bible down, right? None of us can say we've mastered this book. So I guarantee, I guarantee there's times in your life past that you were wrong about certain doctrines, and later on you found out that you were wrong and you adjusted your doctrine. I guarantee there's still some things wrong that we have today, we haven't quite worked out. I'm not talking about major issues. I'm not talking about the blood of Christ, the virgin birth, the second coming. I'm not talking about any of that. I, I'm, I, I'm saying I guarantee in Genesis, from Genesis 1 to 1 to Revelation 22, 21, you haven't completely mastered every detail and every verse in there. And if you're wrong about something, it doesn't necessarily mean you're a heretic. It just means you haven't been taught yet or you, the Lord hasn't shown you or whatever the case may be. But when you purposely come into a church that believes a certain thing and you take your false teaching or your false doctrine and try to infect that church, now you are, be, now you are a heretic. Now you're not just wrong about something. Now you are a heresy, which the Bible calls a work of the flesh. Now look at chapter 6, Galatians chapter 6. We, we, if, you're, if you're here in Sunday school, we talked about what, the book of Galatians is a, is a book uh, correcting the false doctrine, the heresy uh, uh, of teaching that salvation can be attained or maintained by keeping the law and by doing good works. And we saw that that's absolutely false. Our salvation started and began with believing, excuse me, believing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And no works can add or, 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 or uh, add or perfect that salvation. Now, Galatians 6, verse number 12, as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, 
That's what, it, that's what that false doctrine is about. That's what that heresy is about. It's about making a show in the flesh. They constrain you to be circumcised. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 14, that the love of Christ constraineth you. If you are not being constrained by the love of Christ, but you are being constrained by some other man, uh, you, you, you are, your motive is wrong. It says you constrain you to be circumcised only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory, they may glory in your flesh. We just read the verse in the last chapter. Let us not be desirous of vain glory. What do these people want? They want the glory to themselves. Look what God showed me. Look what I found. Look how much I know the Bible. You want to really know the Bible? Come to me. He says, they may glory in your flesh. Verse 14, look at the contrast. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Brother Jim requested that song about when I survey the wondrous cross that tied in very nicely with this verse. The, the song says, God forbid that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. The verse says here, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. What do you have to glory in? If Jesus Christ saved you by his grace, if the only reason you're saved on your way to heaven is because Jesus Christ went to the cross and shed his blood, what do you and I have to glory in? Absolutely nothing. Without the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, we'd be on our way to hell to burn forever. The only thing we have to glory in is Jesus Christ and his cross. But the moment you start trying to glory in something else, something in your flesh that your flesh desires for vain glory, now you are manifesting the works of the flesh. Um, go, uh, go with me. Let's, let's look at a couple examples of this. Go back to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. A heretic, a heretic is about himself. He wants glory for himself. He, he's not interested in building up his brothers and sisters in Christ. He's interested in his brothers and sisters in Christ looking at him and saying, wow, that guy really, really knows the Bible. Wow, that guy's really smart. Wow, we need to follow him. It's not about, it's not about edifying the body of Christ. Acts chapter 5, verse number, verse number 36. For before these days rose up Thutis. Lord didn't exalt him. He, he, rose him. he rose up himself. Rose up Thutis, boasting himself. Not boasting on the Lord, not boasting on the, on the word of God. Boasting himself to be somebody. <laughs> don't, don't you like that phrase? He's boasting himself to be somebody. <laughs> to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves, who was slain, and all as many as obeyed him were scattered and brought to naught. After this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing and drew away much people after him. He also perished, and all, even as many as obeyed him were dispersed. And now I say unto you, refrain from these men and let them alone. For if this counsel or if this work be of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest happily ye be found even to fight against God. Now look at these two men in 36 and 37, uh, Thutis and, uh, and Judas. You know the Bible doesn't even say what they taught or what they preached. It just says they rose up they boasted themselves to be somebody. They drew away much people after them. But the Bible doesn't even say what they taught or what they said. You know why? Because the details of what they were teaching were not important. It's the fact that they were drawing people not to the Lord, but to themselves. And that's the motive of a heretic. Uh, whatever heresy he may be using, uh, the ultimate goal is, is not really to fix uh, the doctrinal problem. The ultimate goal is to get people, uh, disciples, after themselves. And whatever particular heresy they may be using, uh, those come and go and those change. But the heretic is always the heretic. The heretic, the heretic is about himself. 
And there, there's many things that can be used as a heresy, but the heretic doesn't desire to draw people to the Lord and closer to the Lord. He wants to be obeyed, and he wants to be followed. Acts chapter 20. You know, we'll go to Acts chapter 20. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, he says, Be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. And that's what a true minister of the gospel should be able to say. You follow me as long as I follow Christ. But if I'm not following Christ, then stop following me. And a heretic just says, you ought to follow me. You ought to follow what I believe. Acts chapter 20. Look at verse number 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall, shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. That's what it's about, folks. It's about disciples after them. They are trying to gain a following. They're not trying to get you to follow the Lord. They may say that to get your money, but they're after, the, they're after a following for themselves. And uh, over and over and over, we're warned against these people. I guess we're more in danger of it than we really think we are. I guess we're more prone to it than we really think we are. You know, you know what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 11? We won't turn there. You can turn there if you want, but he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 3, Paul says, but I fear, I fear as the serpent beguiled Eve, even so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Now, Paul wasn't afraid of much. In fact, look at this. We're in Acts chapter 20. Look at verse number 22. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. Verse 24, But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. <laughs> the Holy Spirit says, Paul, Everywhere you go, you're going to get bonds and afflictions. Paul said, I don't care. That, 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 that doesn't bother me. It doesn't move me. I'm going on. I'm serving the Lord. Now, in this case, the, Lord, the Holy Spirit himself told Paul not to go to Jerusalem. And he says, well, I'm going, to go. I'm going to go anyways. I'm willing to die. I'll, I'll die for the Lord. I'll be bound for the Lord. It doesn't matter. Now, Paul took beatings and imprisonments and, and, and whippings, and he, he never said, I'm afraid of it. You know what he said I'm afraid of? He said, I'm, I'm afraid. I fear that your minds are going to be corrupted from the simplicity which is in Christ. That's what, that's what Paul was worried of. That's what Paul was afraid of. You know, I think, I think we're more susceptible of this thing than, than we really give ourselves credit for. I think we're more susceptible to following these teachers than we really believe that we're capable of because it's subtle. It comes in little by little, and, uh, and, and, and you, you need to, that's why you need to be in your Bible every single day, because these false t teachers shall come along. They, it's not that they might come along. They shall. They will. They will come along. Uh, turn with me to uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Let's, let's examine the proper foundation and the proper works that we are to build on that foundation. And we'll compare that with, with the heretic and his heresy. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 8. The Bible says, Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Judgment seat of Christ is an individual thing. We're the body of Christ. We help each other. Uh, one, one part affects another part. But at the end of the day, you stand before the Lord. It's just you. You give an account of your life and your labor. 
Verse number nine. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. Verse number 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the foundation. He is the foundation of your church. If, he, if you want your life to count for anything, he needs to be the foundation of your life. If you want your marriage to count for anything, he needs to be the foundation of your marriage. Jesus Christ is the foundation. Verse 12. Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. We were talking about in Sunday school the doctrine of eternal security. You want another one? You, know, you want another verse? Right there. 1 Corinthians 3.15. He himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Everything you've ever done, hope not, everything you've ever done may go up in smoke. You're not going up in smoke. Praise the Lord. But he says in, he says in verse 13, end of the verse, the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. The Lord wants to know not only what you did, but why you did what you did and how much effort you put into doing what you did. The, 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 the trial is the sort, it's the kind, and it must be built on the foundation. If it's not on the foundation, it doesn't count. You say, what is that? Well, how could you build something that wasn't on the foundation? Well, uh, someone who gets up and preaches a sermon, not to instruct believers, not to encourage believers, but to bring glory to their own intellect, to their own Bible knowledge. They may have done works. It may have profited a little bit. Somebody might have gotten a blessing, but it won't stand up at the judgment seat of Christ. If you sing, it doesn't matter, special singing or, or sitting there in the congregation, if your motive for singing is anything but your love for the Lord, it will not stand at, at the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, if your motive for singing is because, well, that's the thing we do, everyone else is doing it, I, I, I might as well do it so I don't stand out, well, I'm glad you're singing, it helps, uh, it helps the sound in the building and all that, but it's, there's no reward at the judgment seat of Christ. The Lord is not interested in what you're doing. He wants to know why you're doing what you're doing. And a heretic, a heretic, he may be doing something, but his motives are not for the glory of God. His motives are for himself. And whatever he may, quote, unquote, accomplish will absolutely not stand at the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, a couple more verses uh, on, this, on this topic. Ephesians chapter 2. We're talking about the foundation of Jesus is Jesus Christ. A heretic, so what's the connection? Okay, a heretic, a heretic makes his heresy the foundation. That's the foundation of his fellowship. Uh, that's the foundation uh, uh, of his life's work. That's everything revolves around that heresy. It's not Jesus Christ. We'll, we'll see that. Amen. We'll see that as we go through Ephesians chapter two. Look at verse number nineteen. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom also ye are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. So look at verse, 20, number, verse number 20 again. We are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Well, who's that? Who's the, who's the foundation of the apostles and prophets? It's Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. It's not a Jesus somebody made up. It's the Jesus Christ preached about by the apostles and written down in Scripture. So you can't say I'm doing this for Jesus Christ if what you're doing doesn't match the Scriptures. 
It's the, it's the Jesus Christ. It's the, found, it's the same foundations that the apostles and prophets had. It's the Jesus of the Bible. It's not just the Jesus that you made up. Uh, uh, get two places, Isaiah 28 and 1 Peter chapter 2. Jesus Christ is our foundation. Everything we do should be for the honor and the glory of Jesus Christ and to please him. You know, you can do, you can do even good things, but they're not for Jesus Christ. You can accomplish works, even good works that the Lord told you to do, but you have in your heart some other ulterior motive than to please the Lord. And nobody says you're not accomplishing something. Nobody says you're not building. Nobody says, nobody's saying good things aren't happening. But the Bible says it's not going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ. And that's the goal, folks. That's, that's the goal of our life is to hear the Lord say, well done. Not anybody else. If they, if they do, fine. That's great. But our goal is to hear the Lord say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Uh, Isaiah 28, look at verse number 16. The Bible says, Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. Well, uh, I wonder what that is. Well, we don't have to guess. <laughs> the Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 2, Start in verse 4. To whom coming, as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. If man disallows it, but God approves, I'll go with God. Uh, verse number 5. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, an holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ, Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Jesus Christ is that precious and sure foundation, that cornerstone of everything we do. Verse number four says, He is the living stone, right? To whom coming is unto a living stone. Verse number five says, We, we also, as lively stones. So we have no, Jesus Christ is the stone that's actually alive. We don't have any life of ourselves. We only have life as we're joined to him. So he is the living stone. We are lively stones. We have, we can't produce life in our, of ourself. Our life is as we are uh, anchored and joined to Jesus Christ, the living stone. And the Bible says in verse number five, he also as lively stones are built up a spiritual House, not, not a physical house. We're not, we're not physical people. We're spiritual people. A holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. You can do spiritual activities and spiritual things, but God only accept it, accepts it if it's done by Jesus Christ, if it's on the foundation, if it's done for his glory. All right, now... <clears throat> Follow this line of thinking, and uh, we'll get back to the, the heretics. But Luke chapter 6, one more passage on this point. Luke chapter 6. We won't take, we won't take to time to run, run all the verses, but Jesus Christ is the rock. 1 Corinthians 10.4, he's the rock. Uh, that rock was Christ, the Bible says. Uh, he is our foundation. He is the chief cornerstone. Uh, he, he is our rock. Luke chapter 6, verse number 46. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? <laughs> why why you call me Lord? I'm not your Lord. You don't listen to anything I have to say. Verse 47. Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them, I will show you to them to whom he is like. He is like a man which built an house and dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. Other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Uh, his foundation is on a rock. And when the flood arose, and the floods will rise, they will rise. The storms and the troubles of life will come. They will come. 
the, when the flood arose, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. Praise the Lord. Uh, verse number 49. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation built an house upon the earth, against which the stream did beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. So here's two men. They both build a house, right? The one that built the foundation, the one that built the house on the on the earth and not on the foundation on a rock, you can't say he was lazy. You can't say he didn't do anything. He did. He built a house. But what was the difference? One built the foundation, one built the house on the rock, one built it on the earth. Notice, notice that in both cases the floods come and the storms come. And whether you build your life on the Lord Jesus Christ, as the song says, the kid's song says, build your life on the Lord Jesus Christ, right? It's a great song. Whether you do that or not, the floods are going to come either way. And, and, and the storms are going to come either way. But what's, what's going to make the difference? The foundation. The foundation. Build your life on the rock of the Lord Jesus Christ. Either way, the floods are going to come. And notice, notice, you ought to do the best you can for the Lord, but the house didn't stand because one house was built better than the other one. The house didn't stand because the skill of the builder was superior to the skill of the other one. The house, the house one house didn't stand because the storms uh, were different or superior or anything like that. The only thing that made the difference was one house was built on the rock, the foundation of Jesus Christ, and the other one wasn't. And uh, one day... One day we're going to pass through this life, and, and the, the only thing, the only thing that's going to get you from here to glory is if your, your, your salvation was built on the rock of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not, up, it's not about how well you built your life. It's not about how strong the, the storms were. It's about was your foundation on the rock. Praise the Lord for that. Now, wh why, do we, why, do we go all to, why do we go all to that? Because like I said before, the heretic's foundation is not Jesus Christ. The heretic's foundation is his heresy. Now, I'll show you that from the Bible. Go to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. And this line of reasoning makes sense in my mind. I hope it's making sense in your mind. Titus chapter 3. <clears throat> Look at verse number 3. The Bible says, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, praise the Lord for, the, for but after that, but after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified, justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works, these things are good and profitable unto men. So, verse number five, we're not saved by our own works. It's not by works of righteousness. But verse number eight, we are supposed to maintain good works. So every, everywhere in your Bible that says we're not saved by works, the next verse or two, somewhere around there, says, but now that you are saved, you're supposed to do good works. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And the very, very next verse says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So here's a, there's a couple things here. Number one, uh, salvation is not earned by works, but now that you're saved, works are supposed to follow your salvation. But number two... Your motivation for those works are, is supposed to be what the Lord did for you. Look at carefully at the verse again, verse number 8. This is a faithful saying, and these things, what are these things? 
Well, we were, verse 3, we were sinners, we were foolish, disobedient, but after that, the kindness, love of God our Savior toward man appeared. Uh, he saved us, Jesus Christ our Savior. He justified by his grace. Verse number 8, these things I will that thou affirm constantly that they which have believed in God, that you and I have saved, might be careful to maintain good works. You know what produces good works in our life? A constant reminder of where God brought us from to where we are now. And you never, you never, never forget where you were before the Lord saved you and never forget what you are now in Christ Jesus. And that reminder and that knowledge should produce the good works in you. See the motive for the works? We're constantly affirmed and reminded of what the Lord did for us, and that knowledge is supposed to help us maintain good works. He says, he says these things are good and profitable unto men. We constantly affirm what Jesus Christ did for us. Now, in contrast, look at verse number 9. But, but, avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. A man that is an heretic, after the first and second admonition, reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. So we had to read the first, the beginning of the chapter to get the context of verse 10 and 11. Verse 10 says, a man that is an heretic, after the first and second admonition, reject. Well, what's the context? The context is someone who doesn't want to constantly affirm what Jesus has done. He wants to constantly affirm, verse number 9, foolish questions, genealogies, contentions, strivings about the law. It's someone who wants to constantly strive, constantly contend, not for the faith, but with the brethren. That's the context of the heretic and his heresy. I believe, I'll give you an example. I believe without, beyond a shadow of a doubt in, in a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. That means we are going to be taken out, we are going to be raptured before the tri tribulation. But I don't constantly affirm it every single time I come to church because that's one point in the Bible out of many. Right? The Bible is a big book. Every page in the Bible is not about whether or not we go through the tribulation. I believe in Genesis chapter number 1, there is a gap of time, which is not an uncommon thing in the Bible, a gap of time between Genesis chapter 1, 1, and 1, 2. You don't have to believe, you don't have to agree with me on that. That's what I think. But I don't constantly affirm that every single time I come to church because that's in one little part of the Bible. It's not the foundation of what I believe. You know what a heretic does? Every time he gets an opportunity, he constantly affirms his heresy because his foundation is not Jesus Christ. It's his pet doctrine that he can't get off of. You find, you find a heretic that believes that we're going through the tribulation. He doesn't just talk about it every once in a while when the topic comes up. No, that's his focus. That's his foundation. If you don't agree with him, you're not in. <laughs> The foundation of the heresy is not Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. It's his own doctrine. It's his own heresy. How do, you, how, do you, how do you keep from being a heretic? How do you keep from following a heretic? Constantly affirm what Jesus Christ has done. The Bible says in John 5, Jesus said, Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Every page in this Bible points you to Jesus Christ. Every page in this Bible doesn't point to your particular doctrine, whatever that may be, but every page in this Bible points to Jesus Christ. You read about uh, the God's covering in the garden, about God providing a covering for Adam and Eve. What does that point you forward to? That points you forward to Jesus Christ. Abel brings a lamb that God accepts. What does that do? That points you forward to Jesus Christ. Passover lamb points you forward to G Jesus Christ. The offerings in Leviticus point you forward to Jesus Christ. The brazen serpent in the wilderness point you forward to Jesus Christ. You see what we're saying? Everything in the Bible points you to Jesus Christ. If your foundation is anything other than Jesus Christ, you're off the foundation. Every time we come to church, I try not to give you the exact same 
sermon, the exact same topic. How boring would that be? I, I've been in churches like that where they, they recycled six, seven, eight topics at most and, and just repackaged it, and every, every time you come to church, it's the same thing. I don't, I don't want to do that. But you know what? Every single time we come to church, we're going to talk about Jesus Christ. Every time we come to church, we're going to constantly affirm what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. That's called being on the foundation, on the foundation. Um, go to, uh, well, look at chapter, same chapter, look at verse 10 again. A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth being condemned of himself. To subvert is to overthrow from the foundation. So what does a heretic do? He gets you off of the foundation and onto his particular pet doctrine or point of contention. Now, we'll come back to here. Go back to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Verse number 1 says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. I hope you're strong in the word of God. Our crowd, our crowd is known for being strong in the word of God, and that's good. You ought to be. I hope you're also strong in the grace. He says, my son, be strong. Be strong in the grace. If you're only strong in the word, but you're not strong in grace, you're going to destroy people. If you're only strong in grace, but you're not strong in the word, you're not going to be much help to people. But you need to know this Bible. You need to study it, like verse 15 says. But you also need to be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Verse number 3, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Verse number 4, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Uh, verse number 5, If a man also strive for masteries, except, uh, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. Look at verse number 8. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Verse 11 uh, it is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. Verse number 14. I kind of picked up the highlights of the first 13 verses. Verse number 14. Of these things, put them in remembrance charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting, the subverting of the hearers. What are the things that Paul told Timothy to put them in remembrance of? Strong in the grace, endure hardness as a good soldier for Jesus Christ. Remember that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Remember to be Remember to suffer with him. Remember not to deny him. Right? We're on the foundation, are we not? We're on the foundation of Jesus Christ. He says, of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Now, look, skip down to verse 23. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. If you have a question because you want to learn more, amen, praise the Lord. But if your question is designed to gender strife and contention, leave it off. Verse 24, and the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. Now, verse 24, the servant of the Lord must not strive. Verse 14, charging them before the Lord that they strive not, about words to no profit. So we're not supposed to strive, right? Now go back and look at verse number five. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. So are we not supposed to strive or are we supposed to strive? Yes. We're supposed to strive for the faith. We're not supposed to strive with our brethren. That's the point. You strive for what the Lord told you to strive. Fight the good fight of faith. That implies there's a bad fight not to be involved in. We fight for the Lord and with the brethren, together with the brethren, not with the brethren against the brethren. 
That's the idea. And, and you, I, you show me someone who's fighting with the brethren, and I'll show you someone who's quit fighting the world, the flesh, and the devil like the Lord told them to. You want, you want to be at peace among yourselves? Look, that's just, look, human, na- human nature, we're going to fight someone. We are, we're going to fight someone. If it's not the world and the flesh and the devil, it's going to be each other. You want to know how not to strive and fight with each other? Fight with each other against the, the uh, with the fight the Lord told you to be in, the, the, Lord, the fight the Lord told you to be involved in. Strive for the faith, for the masteries, the thing the Lord told you about, and then there'll, there'll be much, much less striving together. Now look at verse number 14. Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. What? The same, same thing we're talking about in Titus. Now, go back to Titus chapter 3. Verse number 10, a man that is an heretic after the first and the second admonition reject. So, you warn him, he doesn't listen. You warn him again, he doesn't listen. You say, look, <laughs> next time I hear this out of your mouth, you're gone. You're gone. Because you are not, you are welcome to believe whatever you want to believe. You're not welcome to subvert other people in the church. He says, verse number 11, knowing that he that is such is subverted. He's off the foundation. He has some other foundation than Jesus Christ. And sinneth, being condemned of himself. So his, his problem goes deeper than his heretical teaching. There's sin somewhere in there. That's not me making an, making an assumption. That's what the Bible says. And the Bible says you're supposed to reject him because his problem is not a misunderstanding. His problem is a heart. Heresy is a, where we start, Galatians 5, heresy is a work of the flesh. It's something you need to repent of. It's not something you have to figure out. He says, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, and sinneth. Go to... Go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. The problem with the heresy is his sin. And it doesn't have to do with his head. It has to do with his heart. And and that's the thing I didn't understand when I first started getting my Bible. I thought that if I could just, you know, you're dealing with a heretic. I thought, well, he just doesn't know all the verses. (laughs) I thought, if I could just show him these verses, they're so plain, they're so clear, then then he'll he'll get it. But the Bible says the problem is not a misunderstanding. The problem is his, his heresy, it's not a misunderstanding of his mind. It's a work of the flesh. It's what his flesh desires. He wants vain glory. He wants a following. So you can show him all the verses. He, he what he needs is an admonition to repent. It's something, it's a matter of the heart. It's not a matter of the mind. Now look at, look at this passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 6. Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. We're, we're comparing Old Testament, New Testament. Verse number 7. But if the ministration of death written and graven in stones, that's, that's the law of Moses given on Mount Sinai, the Bible calls it the ministration of death, was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? So we're not going to turn there, but if you read in Exodus chapter 34, Moses comes down from Mount Sinai the second time, with the law of Moses, and the Bible says the skin of his face shone. An actual, an actual uh, brightness was about his face at, at the, at, that he actually had a veil. He actually had to wear a veil over his face because of, of the glory that was shining on his face. And, and verse 8 says, well, if, the, if that ministration was glorious, the ministration of death, how much more glorious is our ministry in the New Testament? Look at verse number 9. For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness 
exceed in glory. Praise the Lord, the New Testament's so much more glorious than the Old Testament. Hebrews says we have it better. We have it better than they did. Verse number 10, for even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech, and not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil, untaken away, and the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. So, the Bible says when those Israelites, just like they couldn't look to Moses' face because the veil was over his face, they couldn't look to the end of that which is abolished. It says in verse 14, until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. So when they look, when now, now when they're reading the Old Testament, the veil is still there. They can't see the purpose of the law. They're still, they're still trying to keep the law. They can't see that the law was, like we saw in Sunday school, our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. They haven't learned the lesson. The law was the schoolmaster. It showed them, they, it's supposed to show them that they were guilty and that they need a savior and that they still haven't graduated. They're still sitting under the schoolmaster, the law. They don't get it. Verse 15, but even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. The veil, in the Old Testament, the veil was a physical veil over Moses' face. What does it say in the New Testament? The veil is over their heart. It's not something physically they, they can't look at. It's something their, their heart can't see. Verse 16, nevertheless, when it... What is the it? Well, it's the heart of verse 15. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. So when Israel turns their heart to the Lord, the Lord's going to take that veil away and show them the truth. And you say, what does that have to do with what we're talking about? Because when Israel reads the Old Testament, what's the problem? Is it their mind? Do they not understand the words? Or is it their heart? It's their heart. And the Lord says, when you change your heart, when you turn your heart, then I'll let you see with your mind what you couldn't see. So the problem with Israel is not their mind, it's not their intellect, it's their heart. And if you want to understand, you'll have to turn your heart to me. So what are we talking about? We're talking about a heretic and his heresy. The problem with a, with a heretic is not in his mind, it's in his heart. And you can show him the verses, and you can show him all the head stuff that you want, but the problem is in the heart. Until he turns his heart to the Lord, he'll never see what's right in front of his face. And you get wrapped up in a heresy, you get wrapped up in a false teaching, uh, uh, the problem is in your heart. The problem is in your heart, you have shifted the foundation from Jesus Christ onto something else. If somebody, we talked, Titus talks about strivings about the law. If someone wants to come in and strive and argue and fight about how someone was saved in the Old Testament, we're not going to do it. We're not going to argue about that. We'll teach from the pulpit what the Bible says about it, but we're not going to strive and argue and contend about it. Because guess what? That's not the foundation of our Christian walk and our Christian life. And let's, let's suppose someone, let's suppose the heretic was actually right. Let's suppose the heretic, let's suppose the church was wrong and, and the heretic was actually technically correct in his doctrine and his teaching about whatever. How men were, we'll say how men were saved in the Old Testament, right? But that man comes in and he turns a church, he destroys a church, over something that's not the foundation, guess what? He's still a heretic, and he's still in the wrong. Even if he was right, he'd be wrong, because why are you striving about the law when our foundation is Jesus Christ? Our foundation is Jesus Christ. You get off that foundation, and you're in the wrong no matter what. So uh, go back to Second Peter, where we started. 
2 Peter. Second Peter chapter 2, look at verse number 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. The Lord is not their Lord. They're, all, they're, all, they're their own Lord. They'll, they'll bring in damnable heresies. Now go back to chapter 1, verse number 5, 2 Peter 1, 5. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. Charity is the high watermark in this, in this Christian growth in chapter 1. A heretic has no charity for the brethren. A, her, a heretic has no love for his brethren. He's using the brethren to get a following for himself. Look at verse number 9. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. So how do you never fall? Is it is it about being to pick apart uh, every, uh, every nuance of the false teachings? No. It's to add to your faith. It's to add everything the Lord told you to add in chapter 1. And he says, if you would obey chapter 1, you would never fall, and you would never have to worry about the false teachers of chapter 2. If you do these things, you shall never fall. But what happens? You don't, add to your fa- you don't add to your faith. You don't stay on the foundation. And guess what? Now you're susceptible for the false teachings. The false teachers cannot overpower you. They cannot drag you off the foundation of Jesus Christ. But what happens? When you voluntarily get off the foundation of Jesus Christ for your life, for your ministry... Then, then you're going to fall prey to the false, false teachers. Look at 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 18. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. So what, what, the conclusion of this book says what? Grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you right now how someone falls prey to these, falls prey to these heretics. I'll tell you right now how it happens. They have no desire to grow in grace. They have only a desire to grow in knowledge. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 that knowledge puffeth up. Knowledge puffeth up. Charity edifies. So guess what? The Bible says, grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Someone says, well, I don't really feel like growing in grace, but I, w- I want to learn. I want to grow in knowledge. I want to learn more stuff. Okay, well, here's, some, here's a teacher to teach you more stuff. But it's not on the foundation. It's not on Jesus Christ. Last verse, Hebrews chapter 13. What happens is people that have walked with the Lord, still find the Bible interesting, and they still have a desire to learn new things, but they've given up on growing in the Lord. They've given up on striving against sin. What does Hebrews say? Ye have not yet resisted on the blood, striving against sin. And so when you lose your desire and your zeal to grow in your personal daily walk, and you, and, and that, you toss that aside... And the only thing you care about now is uh, give me more stuff to learn so I can add to my intellect. Now now, now you're going to be susceptible for some more stuff to learn. Hebrews chapter 13, look at verse number 9. Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats. Which have not been, uh, which have not profited them, that have been occupied therein. The Bible says it's a good thing that the heart, the heart, the heart, 
be established with grace. Be strong in the grace. We're saved by grace, the grace of Jesus Christ. You lose your love and appreciation for the grace of God, and you're headed for destruction. And the Bible says in the beginning of this verse, be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines. Uh, whenever in your Bible you see the word doctrines, plural, doctrines of men, um, 1 Timothy 4 talks about doctrines of devils. Every time in your Bible you see that doctrine in a plural form, it's always false doctrine. And the reason for that is if your doctrine doesn't fit with the rest of the Bible, it's not right. The, the Lord gives good doctrine. If you have a doctrine that doesn't fit with the rest of the Bible, it's wrong. And so every false teaching, what they have to do, they don't just mess up that. You have to mess up everything else because the whole Bible is connected. And if, if what you're saying doesn't match the rest of the Bible, it's wrong. And the Bible says, it's a good thing that the heart be established with grace. Every one of us today needs to search our hearts and our minds because people don't fall prey to heretics because they're not smart enough or they're not intelligent enough. They fall prey to the heretics because in their heart, in their heart, they're no longer thankful for the grace of God. They're no longer rejoicing in the Lord and what he's done for them. Their foundation is no longer Jesus Christ. It's on to something else. We need to stay on the foundation. Other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He is the foundation of, our, of the church. He needs to be the foundation of your life, your, your testimony. Every day of your life, he is the foundation. What am I doing today, and why am I doing it? What is my heart motive for doing what I'm doing? Is it to honor and glorify Jesus Christ, or is it to bring honor and glory to myself? 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whatsoever, therefore, you do, do all, whether you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. It's all about his glory. Father, thank you for the opportunity we've had today. Trust and hope it was a help and a blessing to the folks here. And uh, thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving us such a strong foundation, Lord, because we know the storms will come. We know the floods will rise. Uh, the storms will beat upon our house. And, Lord, thank you for giving us such a solid foundation, our chief cornerstone, a sure foundation, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for that sure hope and confidence. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Take your hymnals, please. Stand with me.